Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to another episode of On the Couch with Creatives. I say good morning because I'm here in the UK, but good afternoon or good evening if you're anywhere else in the world. I'm Melanie Perry. I'm Julie Hadmew. And this is On the Couch with Creatives. Fans and followers of the show will know that we're part of the Creatives Group, the private network for creative professionals across the globe. Together, we support you so that you can create at your best, connect you with like-minded individuals, and therefore help you to grow your creative business. If that sounds like a good idea to you, and you'd like to find out more about joining our growing network of creative professionals, please don't hesitate to chat to us after the show. But, as I say, this is On The Couch. So, Julie, who do we have on the couch today? We have Colin Hinton from North Carolina in the United States. And if everybody or anybody out there who's interested in war movies, war books, military biographies, he's the man for you. He's been a professor of history and sociology in his time. He's authored several military biographies and other non-fiction military works. He works on TV and film production as a history consultant or military history consultant. And he's also worked in front of the cameras presenting history documentaries. He's currently working on a fascinating film project based on his book, The Star of Africa. So we're going to hear all about that. So let's get him on the couch. Hello, Colin. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm caffeine. I'm good to go. <laughs> Super. So hi, Colin. Welcome to On the Couch with Creators. Before we get into talking about um, the Star of Africa, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I was born in 1962 in South Carolina. Uh, my father was Army and my stepfather was Navy and uh, kind of shuffled around a bit. And then for a couple of years, I was educated in Nicosia, Cyprus at the, at the uh, junior school there for the UN. Then I came back to the U.S. to an educational culture shock because it was a, an entirely different educational system that I was using. I was not you know, prepared for the downgrade on intellectual capacity that I experienced. And uh, so to pass my time, and I wasn't playing soccer or football, as you say, uh, which I did for two years professionally, actually, uh, I read a lot of books. I was fascinated with history. My own family history goes back, oh, about 1,400 years. But I... I read books on everything history, military history in particular. My greatest hero of all time to this day from when I was a child was Horatio Lord Nelson. So I studied his life intricately. I even read his personal letters to Lady Hamilton. And uh, so from that point forward, I had this insatiable desire to know everything I could about all aspects of history. And then after my Sporting career ended. I joined the Army for three years, and I was stationed in Europe and back here in the States. I came back and joined the 101st Airborne Division, and then I got out, and a friend of mine recruited me into the Marine Corps, so I did that for about a decade. And uh, then after that, I decided I wanted to get, I had I had to work. I had to do something, and if, I met a man named Norman Melton, who became like a mentor to me, and he suggested that uh because i was writing for magazines military history magazine aviation history world war ii magazine all these magazines i was writing articles because i'd spent years interviewing veterans of conflicts from world war one to the present and uh so he uh he said why don't you go to college and get a degree and i'm like yeah, who's gonna pay for it he goes ah come on let's talk to somebody well he was on the alumni board uh for uh, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. So he got me in and I'd already, I'd already taken what we call the college level examination program examinations, which where you challenge the courses by examination rather than just sit in the, the classrooms. So I, I clipped out a couple of years and uh, I got in, graduated, uh, the first honors graduate in the new program they had. And I was top honors graduate in history. Then I went to graduate school at Temple University in, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that I went to postgraduate school at University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, where I spent about three years, three and a half years. 
And uh, in between that, I spent some time down in Oxford with uh, Sir John Keegan a couple of times, uh, the late Sir John Keegan, probably the greatest historian of the modern age, and uh, had many good conversations with him. He gave me a lot of good pointers, and he gave me some excellent advice that I still carry with me today that later on I will share with your viewers. But I think that his words of wisdom transcend time and place, and I think that there is no greater wisdom than from, than from someone who pursued his own natural dream of wanting to be a historian, a published author, and he gave me information that I gave to my students, and I passed it on to them. One of the things that he always said to me was, if you have a passion for something, let nothing deter you from achieving everything that you can imaginable. He said, obstacles are simply things to overcome, not stop you from pursuing excellence. And I never forgot that. And uh, so that's the way I work and the way I live. So then after graduate school, I uh, was hired by American Military University to teach uh, history, world history, along with my friend, Dr. Brian Mark Rigg, who is an American who received his PhD in Cambridge, England. Uh, we both had mutual interest, mutual interviews, and we knew each other for, for many years now. And uh, he and I created the Holocaust Studies Program for AMU. And then after that took off, I created the uh, Graduate Studies Level Program for the Holocaust Studies Program. And, uh, and then I was very proud to have, in the seven years that I taught there, I was very proud that I had the highest number of honors graduates coming out of that program of any program in the university. And uh, some of those students graduated. Uh, most were military active duty. Many became high ranking officers. Some became agents in various agencies. Uh, some became professors. Uh, many became published authors themselves. And I still get emails or phone calls from, hey, professor, I'm working on this. Can you take a look at it for me? I'm like, yeah, hey, no problem. But I, I think that to be, to be unselfish with knowledge is the only way to be a real educator. I've worked with many historians on various projects who jealously guard their research. They they cloister themselves and put barriers around what they have, and they don't want to share the, the knowledge. Well, okay, but once you publish the knowledge, then it should be disposed, it shouldn't be disposed of, it should be shared with everyone. And that's what I do. And I like to share my information. I have a fellow right now writing a book about his father. He was a fighter pilot in World War II, an American ace. Uh, Alden Rigby. And so he's working on his situation and I'm doing my research from my German sources to put names together for the guys his father flew against, which is what I, I do a lot of that. But no, as far as uh, as far as pursuing my ambitions, I kind of fell into it by accident. I didn't pursue uh, well writing I wanted to pursue. I wanted to write books about history. That was that was a a, a 20 year struggle to get even a publisher to look at me, but I finally did. And I have an agent now that I've been with since 2007, Dr. Gail Wurst out of Princeton International. Uh, so she's been uh, very helpful and I've been, the books have been well received uh, several. Well, I've been, the books are in five or six languages now, so a couple of them. And I got hired to do some television programs, uh, historical documentaries based upon my own research and uh, it just cascaded from there. I mean, people would call me and say, hey, we're doing a show on this aircraft. We're doing a show on these guys. Uh, you interviewed over 400 people, 100 Germans, pilots, you know, people who knew Hitler. And yeah, I got them. So every now and then I'll do a show or even more frequently, somebody will be doing a television documentary. And I may not be on camera for it, but they'll hire me to do the research or, or confirm the research of their own independent researchers which is how I got the job for Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg uh, because they had uh, two or three guys working on research uh, for their nine part uh, mini series, Masters of the Air, which was filmed in England. And so it was recommended that I review the research and I looked at it and I thought, you don't have enough information. So I, after a 10 minute Zoom meeting, ironically, I submitted a couple of things just on my database that I had. And I said, here, these might help you out because I have your information on the dates in question with regard to these missions flown. Here, check this out. And within 10 minutes of the interview, I was hired. And that ended up being nine months worth of income and research.
So there it's we go. Spielberg. You're talking about Spielberg now. Yes, Tom Hanks is Spielberg, yes. That's a okay. tremendous right. thing to get. Name. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? I that I was think, I think, sorry, we're both sorry. asking. We're both <laughs> asking. <laughs> we're both asking. We're both asking. We're both asking. We're both asking. We're both I was going to say, what a fantastic gig to get talking um, off the back of your passion. You know, I think there's nothing like it when you're very knowledgeable about a subject and you bring a passion to it. Um, you know, what a wonderful, what a wonderful, what a wonderful interview to have. Oh, yeah, it was great. And uh, I have to give credit to Jessica Bradbury. She was working for uh, for them in London and uh, she was very, uh, very energetic, I should say. and. It was it was good working with her and talking with her. So and I have to give a lot of praise to Captain Dale Dye, United States Marine Corps retired. He was the chief military advisor for the program, but they needed a German specialist. So, you know, I got that job. But uh, he and Marilyn Walton, one of the producers, who's a friend of mine, uh, made the recommendation. So they interviewed me. I got the job. And Kirk Sadusky, who was one of the directors and producers, uh, also was I suppose, instrumental in in assisting with that. And I was very, very pleased to help them with the program because I take the history very, especially World War II history and aviation history, I take it as a sacred duty to get it right. You know, you you want want to make sure that it's accurate for several reasons. For one, credibility. If you're going to do something and it's not accurate to the best of your ability, then all you've done is spent a lot of money, entertained a few people, but you haven't educated anybody. And so, people get very, very crossed when they pick up um, historical errors. Well, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I I'll be, I'll, I'll be sitting there watching something with friends or family or my girlfriend or somebody, and and all of a sudden we'll be watching something. And I'm like, well, what? No, no, that that didn't happen, or no, th- that's not correct, or that weapon's not right, or whatever, and. Uh, it's just it's it gets it's infuriating to know that someone's going to spend tens of millions of dollars or pounds or euros or whatever, but they're not going to spend the money to get it right. Okay, it would be it, let's say if Steven Spielberg had filmed Jaws and it's supposed to be about a great white shark, but they they throw a dolphin in there. Well, people are going to go. Okay, that doesn't quite work for me. I'm the same way when it comes to military films, and and I'm not alone. My colleagues and my friends around the world will ask me, hey, did you see this latest movie? Did you see 1917? Did you see Devotion? Did you see this? Did you see that? And uh, and 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 if I've seen the film or the series, then I'll say, yeah, I, I have some issues with it. And no, no film is perfect and no series is perfect. You can't expect perfection. The closest you can get is 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 great accuracy to the best of your ability. Because a director on, on the scene of a film, and I've been on a few a few shows, a director who is not a historian, is who does not have a consultant on site, is not going to know that the British soldier who's supposed to be carrying an elite infield is actually carrying an outdated Craig Jorgensen rifle. He's not going to know this. Or a guy who's supposed to be filming a scene with an automobile in 19... If it's 1968, 1970, the guy's not going to be driving a 1984 Mustang down the street. So you want to make sure that you have accuracy in your background, accuracy in your details, uniforms, weapons, and even dialogue. Most people don't understand that dialogue is important in a film because if you're talking about World War II Americans or British soldiers on the Western Front in World War II, let's say Operation Market Garden, the Battle of Arnhem, you're not going to have an American go, yo, homeboy, what's up? Okay. They didn't speak that way. It's just like you have to have the dialogue right for the time. And and I, I, I spoke with uh, Julie before, and she was talking about actors trying to do South African accents. Okay. Ooh. Okay. And if you don't get it right, then people are going to sit back and you're going to lose credibility. The film is going to lose credibility. The director, producer, and the actor is going to lose credibility. And I've seen films where I've seen horrific accents trying to be depicted in a film. Uh, I, we spoke before about Leonardo DiCaprio. Prio in Blood Diamond. I thought he did a pretty credible job. Uh, Matt Damon's not so much with regard to a South African accent. I have friends who are South African and I've been there. So it's like, uh, you know, eh, no. And I thought that uh, Morgan Freeman did a pretty decent job of portraying Nelson Mandela. 
you know, but then Morgan Freeman's a very unique individual. Uh, but I think credibility, accuracy, attention to detail, uh, in the military, attention to detail is everything. And I think that when you apply all three of those to any production and you have the credibility, you have the entertainment value, then you create history on film, not just something people are going to spend money to see and go, eh, OK, I'm not going to buy that DVD. Let's, let's go to... Um... I mean, you, you, you've authored several uh, non-fiction, military non-fiction books. You've authored several military biographies. Obviously, you have areas of expertise. Um, but let's go on to what you are actually working on now, because this is, is absolutely fascinating. Let's talk about The Star of Africa. Yeah, that's one of four films that we're putting together with investors and producers. And I just got my 14th letter of interest from an actress yesterday. So people are seeing this and they're wanting to be a part of it. And uh, I can't specify that the A-list actors that uh, we're working, trying to get, but we have interest from well-known names from Australia, Great Britain. I can mention Luke Adams. You may not know who he is, but he's, he's starring in a series about an MI5 agent on, on television there he, he's a friend of mine and uh he's also part of this process he wishes to be a part of the star of africa and anything else so we have four projects but the one that's uh, going to be the biggest budget the one that i have prioritized with regard to uh securing the letters of interest producers directors uh, distribution which is huge uh and meeting with investors is the star of africa and that's a passion of mine for a number of reasons first and foremost is the story of hans yoka marseille who by the time of his death at age 22, he was the most famous man in Germany during World War II, and he was very well known to his enemies, uh, but for good reasons. And I interviewed over 20 men who flew combat with him. I interviewed all three of his commanding officers. I interviewed four pilots he shot down. Uh, and the story, I read several books about him written by other authors in German and English over the years. There are seven that are, are credible books. But the one thing I noticed they were missing, and my friend, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Tate, U.S. Air Force retired, wrote a book about Hans Marseille that I thought was one of the best. But what they were lacking were the interviews, the personal perspectives of all the guys who knew Hans Marseille, whether they were British, Canadian, Australian, New Zealanders, South Africans, but the Germans, you know, the people who knew him, even 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 one of his girlfriends I interviewed. Of course, Lenny Riefenstahl never admitted she was his girlfriend, but she admitted that we had a great weekend together. <laughs> so, you know, read into it but what you will. He was a World War II flying ace, right? He had the most yeah. kills during World War II. He didn't have the most kills. No, he only had 158. But uh, but he was the top scoring ace in North Africa. And he was the top scoring German ace against Western Allied aircraft. Even though he died in 42 and the war did not end until May 8th, 45, no other German pilot shot down as many Western flown aircraft as he did. And uh, and he was uh, he became a legend for a number of reasons, not just because he was great at getting multiple victories in the air, uh, five, four, five, six, seven, eight kills in a mission. Uh, and I'm, when I say kills, I'm referring to the aircraft, not the man flying the aircraft uh, on many occasions. He would actually try and save the life of the man he shot down because he did not believe that a man already beaten in combat should die for no reason. So sometimes he would fly alongside and he would tell his wingman, don't shoot the guy. You know, I got him. And he would give him a chance to bail out, to jump out of his aircraft so he wouldn't die. Uh, other times, if the aircraft was too shot up or if it was too low and damaged, he would just guide it into a crash, controlled crash landing in the desert. And then he would fly by and his guys would check and see if the guy was alive or OK. But either way, he had a habit of uh, taking off and looking at his map on his knee, checking his compass, his clock, his fuel gauge. And he would say, OK, I got something to do. And then he would write a note in perfect English. He would write a note and then he would fly to the to an enemy air base. Uh, primarily 250 Squadron was the was the closest base to him on many of these operations. He knew the route. so. He would fly over, slide the window on his canopy, you know, tie the note to his water bottle or something and throw it in. And what he was doing was he was telling his enemies where to go get their wounded, injured or, or abandoned pilot because he didn't want the man to die out in the desert. Uh, he did that the first time when he shot down uh, Lieutenant Patrick Byers, who was uh, a South African pilot flying with the Australian Squadron 250. 
uh, at the time, he was flying reconnaissance de detached to 250. And uh, Marseille shot him down, and Byers had to bail out of the aircraft, but he was on fire, and 70% of his body was burned when they found him. So Marseille and the guys got him. They brought him to their base. They waited uh, a couple of days for the ambulance to take him to the airstrip so they could take him to Derna Hospital. And uh, during that two- or three-day period, he and Byers became friends. Byers held no grudge against Marseille for shooting him down. That was his job. It was war, you know, but Marseille tried to save his life. And so as soon as Byers was taken to the hospital in Derna, Marseille, without authorization or even telling anybody, jumps into his Messerschmitt, takes off, flies to 250, and drops his note that Patrick Byers was shot down. He's in, he's safely in the hospital with, with regards to the Luftwaffe. Well, that let them know the man was no longer missing in action because he never returned from his reconnaissance mission. So they knew where he was. Okay, great. Two weeks later, Marseille gets the note, uh, well, a radio call from Derna saying, uh, with, we have to tell you that your, your friend, <laughs> the South African Patrick Byers, died of his wounds. So Marseille kind of had a breakdown on that one because he and Byers were talking about getting together after the war, having a party, you know, and so it really hurt him badly. So he jumps into his Messerschmitt again and flies back to the base, writes a note telling them, with regrets, Patrick Byers died of his wounds, you know, so sorry. And he drops the note and that let them know that Byers was dead. Uh, and I interviewed two of the men on the ground who witnessed both of these events. Uh, Jeffrey Morley Mower, squadron leader, who was a professor at George Mason University in Virginia, here in the States. And uh, squadron leader Michael Judd, who was the commanding officer at that time, who was living in Houston, Texas. So they, I guess they came over here because they wanted to have a change of venue. And then... He did three more flights like that that we know of. Now, it's possible he did other flights that were not recorded or detected, but we know there were three more flights that he did. And the most important one to me that goes full circle with the book, and this is why writing books like this becomes so important, because when Marseille shot down a man named Graham George Buckland, an Australian with 250 Squadron, he shot him down. As Buckland was shooting his friend Ludwig Franziskett, who I also interviewed. So Marseille saved Franziskett by shooting up Buckland's uh, P 40 Tomahawk. Buckland tried to bail out, but as he did, the horizontal stabilizer, the tail struck him and killed him, and he hit the desert floor without opening his parachute. And that was right near German lines uh, in no man's land. So they landed, and so Marseille, Schroer, uh, Gustav Rudel, and uh, a couple of other pilots. Uh, showed up and they found Buckland's body and they knew they couldn't, they didn't have the capacity to take him back and bury him because they only had a small vehicle. So Marseille took all of his personal effects. He took his wristwatch, which had stopped right at the point of impact. Uh, he took his uh, photographs, his fountain pen, very expensive fountain pen. And that comes back as part of the story later and his uh, pay book, his ID book and everything like that. So he puts it into a bundle and then Marseille gets back to the base. And then without telling anybody, once again, anything at all, he jumps into his Messerschmitt, flies to 250. And uh, he, he's got a big bundle here that it won't fit through the sliding window. So he's having to come in and his wingman, Reiner Pertgen, is flying above him. Now, the first two times Marseille flew to the base about buyers, the anti-aircraft tried to shoot him down. So we had to go in very low, just maybe two meters off the deck, his propeller barely touching the desert floor so that the guns couldn't depress and hit him, drops his notes. Well, this time when he goes to notify them about buyers, he's coming in low, but Mike Judge like takes a tablecloth off the table and starts waving it. He gets on the loudspeaker and says, hold your fire, hold your fire. Let's see what he has to say this time. So he's, wa he's waving the sheet and Marseille waggles his wings and he slows down, lowers his landing gear to reduce his speed. He cracks his canopy open a little bit and drops the package and flies down the runway, lifts his landing gear, continues on. And then he does an air show over the airfield and he's doing all these great maneuvers. And Jeff Moore told me, he said, yeah, I'm watching him. We're watching him do all these aerial uh, tricks and aerobatics. And all I can think of is that that's how he shot me down once. And uh, so then Marseille comes flying back down the airstrip 
and they read the note and they see that, okay, J Graham Buckland's dead. Here are his personal effects. Please give them to his mother uh, with regrets. Here's his body coordinates. Go pick him up. Give him a decent burial. So Marseille's slowly flying down the airstrip and Mike Judd tells everyone to salute him. So they salute him and Marseille flies and salutes back and then he peels off. It's a great story. It's, it's a great... It's a wonderful story because he had the respect of his enemies and the respect of his compatriots. And the, the, the war arena in North Africa was, was like a completely different war from, from, from the European war, obviously. And when Rommel took Tobruk, um, a lot of South Africans and Australians were, were captured, weren't they? And he made friends with them as well, didn't he? Yes, he did. In fact, uh, Marseille was actually in Germany uh, doing his propaganda tour for Hitler and Goering. And uh, when Rommel took Tobruk, and when he came back in August of 42, uh, his friends had said, hey, we have a new barber and a new cook. And it turned out to be one of the South African prisoners of war, Matthew Latuku, who they called Matthias or Matthias. And, and they kept him because they liked him. They liked him. And they said, well, you know, we're going to keep you here. And Marseille arrives back and they introduce the two guys. They become good friends. And Marseille says, hey, and Marseille spoke fluent English, French, Latin, Greek. I mean, the guy was very well educated. So he says, hey, come on in here and, 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 and be my tent mate. So he brings the black man in, understanding that Nazi Germany was, you know, perhaps the most racially segregated country in, on planet Earth. So here's this lieutenant bringing in a black POW, an enlisted man, and he brings him into his tent and he introduces him to his illegal record collection. So Marseille had this massive record collection with this crank wind up uh, phonograph and he would play his jazz music and his ragtime music, which was banned in Nazi Germany. It was totally banned in Germany. And get, getting caught with that stuff was enough to have you arrested, but he didn't care. So he's playing his band music and they became great friends. And, uh, and the Germans I interviewed who were there said that Marseille and, 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 and uh, Matthew Latuku had a very special relationship, a very special bond, because, and part of that reason I believe and they believed was when Marseille was in Germany, he was in uh, Rastenburg to get his medals from Hitler, his oak leaves and uh, swords to his Knight's Cross. But when he went to Berlin, he was asked to perform a concert because he was a trained, classically trained concert pianist. His mother had been a music teacher and he had grown up playing music his whole life. And uh, so all the Third Reich hierarchy are there. Everybody, Hitler, Goering, Martin Bormann, everyone, Himmler, Goebbels, Magda Goebbels. I mean, so he's playing this approved list of music and everything for about an hour. He's playing the classics. And then all of a sudden, according to the two men I interviewed who were there, Arthur Oxman, who was, who was the leader of the Hitler Youth, I interviewed him. And Hans Bauer, who was a World War I ace, who was Hitler's personal pilot and best friend. And both of them told me the same thing. They said, yeah, we're watching this guy. He's playing beautiful music on the, on the keyboard. There's a, there's a violinist, there's a cellist. Uh, and it's beautiful music, a good, great chamber music type uh, scenario. And then all of a sudden, he stopped in the middle of one performance, gave a stupid smile, and winked at everybody and Started playing Scott Joplin ragtime. Bah, 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 bah. And so that just blew the head gasket off of everybody there. And then Hitler stood up and said, hey, we've heard enough. And he cleared the room. And uh, Arthur Axman told me, he said, yeah, I, I, felt, I thought I was going to pass out. My blood went cold when he did that because uh, that was enough to get a man shot. And uh, Magda Goebbels apparently was laughing so hard she, she spewed her wine all over the place. And... Uh, so that was just one of his things. But afterwards, they had the party for the heroes. All the guys who were decorated by Hitler for heroism on the Eastern Front, North Africa, wherever, they got their medals. And so they had this big party, propaganda party. So everybody's there. And uh, it was at this time when Marseille overheard SS Lieutenant General Carl Wolf just happened to mention to Adilio Globochnik uh, and uh, a couple of others that they had completed Operation Reinhardt, uh, or the reduction of Ledice in uh, in Czechoslovakia, as a result of the attack on Reinhardt Heydrich that killed him. 
And uh, apparently, and Wolf told me this personally because I interviewed him and he said he was asked a question about Rudolf Hirsch, who was now the new commandant of a new camp called Auschwitz. And he goes, yeah, yeah, he's he's taking care of stuff. He Apparently, he says he can process five, six thousand Jews a day. Well, Marseille overheard this conversation. And everything became clear to him. He had been to Berlin back home. He was from Charlottenburg District, Berlin. He'd gone home several times, but all of his Jewish friends were gone. His family doctor, his friend Felix, everybody was gone. Where the hell did they go? Oh, they they relocated. They left. They got deported or whatever. No one said anything about death camps because most people didn't know about the death camps. That's why it was so top secret. But that's where his friends had gone. And he knew at that point in time that his country was murdering people. Now, this is a guy who was so sensitive that he couldn't harm an animal. And as a kid, he got in trouble. He got into fights because he would play on the soccer team, football team, with his Jewish teammates. And when they were being harassed, he got into fistfights protecting them. And that got him in trouble because his father at that time was a colonel, later a major general in the Luftwaffe. And his father said, you know, there's a policy against Jews here. So you need to kind of like moderate your 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 uh, your approach to this situation. And apparently Marseille was like, to hell with that. I mean, wrong is wrong, right is right. Then he sees Kristallnacht. He sees what happened in Berlin. And then he, but none of this came together until July of 1942, when he learned of what was going on. So he goes back to North Africa. He's telling all of his friends about this. Werner Schorre interviewed, Gustav Rudel, Eduard Neumann, Franz Stiegler, all the guys, uh, Francis Kett. I mean, he's telling these guys about, hey, I heard this. I heard this. And they're not believing him. Because you have yeah, to understand. They, they didn't know that it, it's an awful feeling, though, that you're fighting for your country and you and you feel that you're doing on, it honorably, and then you suddenly realize what you're fighting for is pure evil. Exactly, and and he realized it, and he realized it, and and he realized that they're fighting for a regime that had no problem murdering human beings. Mm-hmm. War, war is war. Everyone understood that. If you've been a soldier, if you've been a pilot, if you've been in in any branch of military service during a time of conflict, you understand that there are things that you have to do, and that's your job. You live with it or you don't, but you do it. Marseille had a real problem even shooting down men and killing them, because that's why he tried to save. He pulled men out out of burning aircraft that he shot down. So he had a real problem with just just wanton killing. To him, killing was anathema. And he made the comment to Gustav Rodel, he goes, well, we have to do what we can to save lives because at the end of the day, the only person we have to answer to is God. And Rodel told me, he said, "Uh, Hans, uh, no, actually, there are some people in Berlin who might take exception to that line of thought. And uh, he said, the hell with them. They'll answer to God, too. And then, you know, later on, he said, I guess I'm right. But, uh, yeah, he was a humanist, really, in many ways. And uh, but he's very effective. But he he cared about people. Yeah, a, a, a wonderful human being, really. And and I mean, we could you we could actually listen to this tale the whole day um, because he was such a fascinating individual. But obviously, we want people to uh, read your book. <laughs> it's out there, right? They can buy it. It's on ebook now. The hardcover sold out years ago, but I rewrote the book as a second expanded edition with new information. Well, it's new information because I had a word count restriction on the first book. I couldn't put all the information into it. So I rewrote the book, expanded the edition, more interviews, more information, more details, more documentation. Uh, and hopefully that'll be out perhaps sometime next year, if not the year after. And uh, but I think it's going to be hopefully the film will be out the year year after. So we're looking what two three years before we can see the film. Well, hopefully, because right now we have to get funding, and we have the script for a feature film, the screenplay for the feature film, but we also have a screenplay for a, for a pilot episode for a ten part series. So waiting to see where that goes. We have the production and directorial and the actor interest. We just have to make sure that we have the investors are happy with what they see. And I have a meeting on the 21st with one set of people. And uh, but like I say, I have four projects with four four different people. But this is the largest on the budget. 
And I've, I've contacted all my people who own all the aircraft from World War II, the pilots who fly them, Duxford guys, my, Sam Worthington leads to those guys at the Typhoon Project and Duxford. Have been, he's a great guy. He helps out the guys here in the United States, the guys in Australia. So we have the aircraft. We have we, well, we have two or three CGI companies to help out with the air combat scenes. Uh, right now, we're just trying to figure out one producer wants to film it in Morocco. One wants to do it in Australia. So uh, that's beyond me. I'm just a historian. I'm just a consultant. I'm just a guy to make sure they do it right. So I don't care where they film it. I just want to get this great story out in front of people so they can learn something that's a little bit, a bit of history that most people don't know anything about. It's a wonderful opportunity for actors around the world because you've got the English, you've got the American, you've got the Australians, you've got the South Africans. They're all fighting in North Africa at the time. Um, so, so that's very and, and And the Italians. And the Italians, of course. <laughs> oh, this is so fascinating. So, so as a as a historical or his, uh, a military historian, uh, TV film consultant, author, film writer, screenwriter, whatever. I mean, just the whole plethora of stuff that you do as a military historian. What would your top three tips be for somebody who is interested in the same things that you are interested in? Well, first of all, I'm not the screenwriter. My partner in crime, also a former Marine, retired Marine, Michael Droberg, he's my screenwriter. And uh, so I would say, if you want to write books, find yourself someone who knows more than you who's published and see if they'll guide you through the process Try to find a good agent because the bigger publishing companies won't take unagented writers most of the time. Make sure that you submit the most polished product you can. Do your research. Read everything on the subject and become the best expert on your subject, just like with a dissertation or a thesis. Make sure you know more than your examiners. Be the expert on your subject because if you're not, the readers are going to pick you apart. The second advice I would give is... Once you find something that you're interested in to the point to where you'll sacrifice other stuff to get it done, charge into it. Focus on it. Don't get distracted. OK, do it. If you want to get your degree in history or your degree in physics or biology or botany and become an expert in your field, pursue that. Don't get distracted. Don't let people pull you apart. Don't pull, let them pull you off the track. The third thing I would say is due diligence, but also humility. Give credit where it's due to the people who help you. When you write something, make sure you mention those who helped you along the way, because that shows magnanimity, but it also shows intellectual honesty. But I would say persevere. Don't stop. I had over 200 rejections before my first book was ever published because I was doing it wrong. I didn't have anyone to guide me until my friend, the late Colonel Ray Tolliver, who introduced the world to the German fighter pilots with his series of books, Gave me some pointers and helped me out. And he said, this is, this is what you're doing wrong. So he helped me break through the barrier. But the biggest thing I could say is that just be honest with the history. And if you want to get into TV consulting, film consulting, documentaries, things of that nature, you have to be published. You have to be known for what you know. You can't just send a letter and go, hey, I've got a degree in history and I'd like to be a consultant for the History Channel. Uh, I know you're doing a series on pirates. So I read a book about, you know, Edward Teach, Blackbeard. So I'd like to, that's not going to get you the job. What gets you the job is when they call you and say, hey, we read your articles. We read your books. We, we, we saw you uh, on this podcast, maybe, or something. But we would like to, to interview you about possibly being a consultant or being a talking head on TV about this project. That's how you get the job. You've got to do the groundwork, do the study, get the knowledge, uh, advertise that knowledge, publish the knowledge. And then once your credibility is established in your field, that's when the people will come to you because the people doing these projects want accuracy. They want credibility. They want the best, most polished product they can produce. And when that happens, they'll, they'll come find you. They'll locate you. Can we watch a trailer of the Star of Africa? Because it's it encapsulates very quickly the whole story about uh, what about this incredible man, and um, and gives us a taste, a foretaste of what is to come on the big screen. Well, if it's big screen or if it's uh, streaming series, I don't know. I don't know where that's going to go. But what people will see 
is a story of a young man who is ambitious, arrogant, uh, a playboy, or as the British would say, a Jack the Lad, extraordinary. Uh, he has no problem seducing women, married or not, and uh, jumping out of bedroom windows when their fathers come in, uh, stealing cars from his commanding officers to make to have his dates in town, uh, being drunk on duty, uh, totally undisciplined, absolutely nothing resembling military discipline in him whatsoever. Uh, but he's so effective at what he does, they give him a lot of latitude. But you're going to see a guy who's who's not just an expert in his craft of, fi uh, of fighting in the air. You're going to see a guy who's also a very humanistic type of person. He doesn't see the need to needlessly kill. He doesn't see that as being his priority. His priority is to shoot down aircraft. That's his job. But if the guy dies, that's war. But there's no reason to make sure the guy's dead, unlike the Australian Clive Caldwell, whom they saw on several occasions machine gun their own pilots under his under their parachutes uh another thing about the film is you'll see that uh historically accurate so many of the germans who were anti-nazi they were not part of they were not members of the nazi party and those who did learn of the they knew about the racial policy everyone knew about the racial policies in germany when jews became a race and not a religion under hitler segregation they knew that Many didn't like it. Some said, "Okay, it's not it's not me, so I'm not going to deal deal with it." They 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 didn't pull the Dietrich Bonhoeffer and and raise their voices. But they're going to see a group of men who are fighting a tough war, outnumbered against a very tough and determined enemy, the Allies, and primarily the South Africans and Australians were, were the heaviest combats. But they're going to find a group of men who finally realize that they're fighting for a very evil regime. So what do they do? Well, they still have a country and a people to protect. They may not like the politics of their country, but they love their country, love their people, and they have their oath of service to the country. Uh, so they continue fighting through the end of the war. And then you have the allies, which have to be given a very heavy uh, part of the story because their individual stories are important. What did the individual pilots in, in, in the Australian Royal Australian Air Force, the South African Air Force, think about Marseille when they learned who he was. They knew for a year and a half, Yellow 14, that's a bad guy, stay away from him. But in 1940, early 42, they learned his name. They figured out who he was. That's when the, the legend began. Okay, Yellow 14, if they if you see him in the air, stay away from him unless you've got four to one odds on him. Okay, don't, 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 don't try to fight him. Don't do it. Just, you know. And I think they're going to see a very heroic tale from all ends, not just Marseille and the Germans, but you have some very heroic South Africans uh, and, and Australians, Canadians, British, and even the Italians. Uh, you're going to see a story of men who had a lot of courage, a lot of moral fortitude, and a, men, a group of men on all sides who hated the war. They hated having to do what they did, but they did it because it was their job. And then at the end of this process, what I have is a montage of photographs where I would like to have the photograph of the actor portraying the actual person in the film next to each other with a paragraph stating what happened to this person during or after the war. So that way, at the end of the film, you get to see a visual. You say, OK, this guy played Hans Joachim Marseille. This guy played Neumann. What happened to them after the war or during the war? And it kind of like sums it up for them. Mm -hmm. And I would like people to realize that, yeah, you can fight an enemy, but that doesn't mean your enemy's evil. Propaganda turns your enemy into an evil person unless the enemy is, in fact, evil, like many in Nazi Germany were, especially those who were involved in the concentration and death camps. So I think that people need to be educated. I think they need to see the other side of World War II, uh, both sides of World War II, in the same project. What were the Allies thinking? What were they saying? What were the Germans thinking? What were they saying? How, how much distress did they have with their own government? I think those are political paradigms that have to be thrown into the story so people can understand that there was a reason why Hitler had 30 attempts to kill him by his own people. People only know about Stauffenberg. There were 29 other attempts to kill Hitler, okay, because people didn't like him. And, and this movie will help hopefully explain why there was so much dissent within the German military. Let's take a look.
So that was the trailer for the start of Africa. And I must say, I can't wait to see this project come to fruition. I will definitely be going to see it. And I want to read the book too, because I think it is just a tremendous piece of work. On that note, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Colin for joining us on the couch today. What a tremendously amazing, interesting man you have been. And thank you so much for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it. And we wish well, you all the best for your project. Looking forward to seeing it all. Well, I, I appreciate uh, you giving me some time to talk about them. And it's been nice being with you guys. And later on, maybe we'll do another show about another project. Exactly. Lovely. I, was, I could talk to you all day. I'm, I'm quite upset that we have to wind this up now. I think we should do like we could we could do a mini series on interviewing you, Colin, and, and, and your history and your knowledge. It's just tremendous. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you so much for talking to you. Keep us up to Not date. Not Thank you very much. And we can help put put out the word when when things are due out. We would love to uh, to get some support for you. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, I'll keep you updated on what happens. Please do. Please do. On that note, we've run out of time. We have to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Colin. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you, our audience, for tuning in and listening to us today. But until next time, we'll see you. Yeah, I...